Today we're going to talk about practicing MLA citation style in your papers. This is part two of our two-part research workshop. The first thing to know about citations, whether you're working with MLA, APA, Turabian, CSC, Chicago style, any type of citation that you do in college writing is going to show up in two places. The first place is inside the body of your paper. This is in-text citations. Sometimes this is called parenthetical citation. Sometimes this might look like footnotes or little numbers um, up above the sentence. Either way, you have something within the text to note where you're including information that's not invented in your own brain. Paired up with that are end text citations. So in MLA, we call these works cited. In APA, they're called references. They're called other things, other places. This is a list of titles and publication information for the sources. This is included at the very end of your paper, not included in your total word count, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what you think of that. But the key thing to know is that you always need both. You can't have one without the other. One doesn't make sense without the other. An in-text citation by itself is referencing a source whose title and publication information you don't have, so you can't find. A work cited entry at the end notes that you have included a source, but without in-text citations, you don't know where it's been included. They work together. So what's the difference anyway? You heard me mention several different citation styles at the beginning of this PowerPoint. How are they different? Who cares? Well, there are four main features that differentiate one citational system from another. Author attribution, location, punctuation, and capitalization. These seem like little things. They are little things. There are small details, but for somebody who knows what they're looking for and has practiced in using these different citation systems, they're very obvious. It's very quick to see whether somebody is working with MLA or APA citation, for example. So let's look at some samples of in-text MLA citations. I'm going to give you a minute to look at these two sentences and think about what you notice. Where are the authors attributed, for example? What is the location of each citation, how is it punctuated and capitalized? Okay, so let's talk through the first example which has a direct quote. Christine Haney reports that shortly after Japan made it illegal to use handheld phones while driving, accidents caused by using phones dropped by 75%. So where is the author attributed? Well, we understand Christine Haney to be the author. Since she's attributed in the sentence, her last name does not appear in the parentheses. The location of the citation is immediately after the end quotation marks, but before the period. And something that's interesting for MLA citations, um, they use what's called titular capitalization, which just means that you capitalize all the important words. So of course, proper nouns would fall into this category. Okay, so let's look at the second sample. Most states do not keep adequate records on the number of times cell phones are a factor in accidents. As of December 2000, only 10 states were trying to keep such records. So 
what we can see here is, first of all, there's no direct quote, which surprises a lot of students, um, but it is really important to note that you should always cite paraphrases as well as direct quotes. And since the author is not attributed in the sentence itself, in our citation here, we need to have the name of the author the last name of the author. The numbers that you see here, that 18 in the first sample, number 2 in the second sample, these are page numbers. And one thing that I'd like you to notice especially is that in the second sample here where we have Sundin and the page number 2, there is no comma between the last name and the page number. Now, when you're creating in-text citations, this is because you're integrating ideas, information from other sources into your own paragraphs, your own ideas. So this beautiful rainbow slide is demonstrating to you what's called the quote sandwich or a paraphrase sandwich Basically, it's the idea that if you're integrating a quote or a paraphrase from an outside source, it needs to have a strong intro and a strong outro, sandwiching it, so that readers know why it's there. It's not self-explanatory to readers. Even if they read the quote itself very carefully, at best, a reader can only make inferences unless you as the writer lead in directly. You introduce the topic and prepare the reader for the quote. Use a signal phrase or a verb to indicate that, hey, this quote or this paraphrase is coming up. You insert that direct quote or the information that you're paraphrasing, cite the source, and then, really important, lead out from that quote or that paraphrase. Continue the discussion. Explain why that quote was important, why it's there. What does it tell us about your argument? You need to have a whole sandwich. Just like a regular sandwich, you don't want it to not have a bottom piece of bread. That would be gross and messy. Your quote or your paraphrase will be gross and messy if you don't have a lead in as well as a lead out. Here's a quick list of just a few signal verbs to use. Of course, everybody loves to say so-and-so states, so-and-so stated. So I've even seen a, another popular one is... Uh, Mr. Dr. Timothy quoted, as quoted in, mm, those are okay and they'll do the job, but there are literally dozens of different signal verbs that you can use. Some of them are up here. There's even more out there. Um, but play around with it. See what works for you and definitely try to mix up the signal verbs that you use. Okay, now when we think about the MLA Works Cited list, we're going to use the same four features that we looked at before with the in-text citations, and we're going to focus on end-text citations. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to look at these two samples, and we'll look at author attribution, location, punctuation, and capitalization. Okay, so the first thing that we should notice is that the authors are attributed at the very beginning of each citation. And there is what's called a hanging indent. So that means the first line is all the way aligned with the edge of the paper and everything underneath it is 
tabbed one space. In the first example, we see the title of the publication, The Allen and Bacon Guide to Peer Tutoring. It's in italics. That should help us understand that this is a book. This is a whole publication. And Allen and Bacon are the publishers as well as mentioned in the title. In the second sample, the supermarket place of images, television as a mediated mediation in DeLillo's white noise. That whole mouthful of a title is in quotation marks, which should lead us to know that that is a smaller piece of a larger publication. Articles, chapters, song titles, blog posts, smaller excerpts of larger publications get their titles put in quotation marks. And the whole publication, the whole enchilada, in this case, Arizona Quarterly, gets put in italics. Some other brief things to know about a work cited for MLA style. Of course, you're going to alphabetize by author's last name. List all the authors. The first word in each title is capitalized and any proper nouns. So that's that titular capitalization we talked about earlier. Like we just said, you'll italicize the titles and subtitles of books or periodicals or larger publications. Put quotation marks around titles and subtitles of chapters, articles, or the smaller pieces inside the larger. And here we've only looked at two types of sources, a book and a scholarly article. But please know the protocol shifts slightly depending on each source. For example, if you're citing a television episode or a blog or a website, I would recommend referencing the OWL at Purdue. If you Google it or if you follow this link below, you'll be able to check on the type of media that you're trying to cite.